Hello, everyone. One more round of applause for this panel that just passed, an amazing panel. I was taking notes to share a little bit of that information. My name is Maria Elena Salinas. I am a journalist uh, at the moment, a uh, contributor with ABC News, previously for a bunch of decades, a uh, Univision News anchor. And I'm very happy and very excited here to be, to be here for this very important topic and very timely uh, conversation with Sarah Kate Ellis, President and CEO of GLAD. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, as we know, GLAD is the world's largest LGBTQ media advocacy organization working to ensure the stories of LGBTQ people are included in every form of media in English and in Spanish. I can vouch for that because, you know, when I was at Univision, we got a lot of GLAD awards. Mm -hmm. And GLAD, you know, they tackle the tough issues to shape the narrative and provoke dialogue that leads to cultural change. And talking about tough issues and cultural change, it just so happens that LGBTQ issues have been in the news a lot lately. In fact, as we speak right now, the House of Representatives is voting on the Respect, Marriage, Respect of Marriage Act. Mm -hmm. Tell me what your sources say, because I saw you looking at your phone and it, you said, it's passing, it's passing, it's passing. Yeah, they're, they're count, am I on? It'll come, okay. Um, well, thank you for having me, and it is breaking news. Um, they're, uh, they finished the, ca the, the vote, and they're in the count right now, um, but they said um, they're still counting, but we have it. We have it. It passed. Sarah Kate, tell us, tell us what... Tell us what that means and what that means, because as we know before, it depends on what state you live in, the way that you're treated. What does this mean for, for, for the community and really for the country? Absolutely. So for, I, it really just made me tear up when I said that. I didn't even realize I got overwhelmed by it. Um, so in, in the wake of Dobbs, being rolled back um, by the Supreme Court. It was crystal clear, because the court said it in their decision that, um, and their opinion that they were looking to roll back marriage equality. So what that means is, is that that would go back to the states. In 35 states in this country, it's illegal. Um, it would immediately be illegal to get married if in a same-sex couple. So what we moved forward was a um, an act called the Respect for Marriage Act, which means that we can't influence what happens at the state. What we can influence is that the state recognizes a marriage, even if it's from another state. So if marriage does get rolled back by the Supreme Court, um, now we have a protection in place that if you get married in any of those other states, it has to be recognized by the state that you're in, even if they don't allow marriages. Um, so it continues to be a patchwork. You know, it's emotional, and then it's so disheartening at another level that we're still here. We're still having these conversations. We're still defending who we are and why we exist. But this was a major step forward on top of something else that happened today. Exactly, <laughs> and we are still going with the headlines of the day. The headlines of the day, as you know, if you haven't heard, if you haven't seen it come up on your phone, uh, Brittany Griner was freed today. What is your reaction to that? You know, I'm a mother of twin 13-year-olds. Uh, Brittany is, you know, older, but I, I feel like she's been my daughter away. It feels like she's coming home. She's on the plane. She might have landed already. Um, and um, I think we, it, it was a bleak outlook. It was honestly a very bleak outlook. That was what all the sources were saying, that there was, the negotiations had stopped. Um, and so for this to now have moved forward so quickly and to have her home um, is just outstanding. And, and I knew, you know, the Kremlin is very anti-LGBTQ. So I thought for sure, you know, here you have a black LGBTQ person in Russia. We're never going to see her again in her white, uh, you know, I just couldn't fathom it. But here we are. I mean, it's, it's a great day. It's a great day to be gay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
there are more stories that are making headlines that I want to talk to you about. But before we get to that, I, tell me a little bit about, about you, how long you have been with GLAAD, and, and what brought you to the organization. So I've worked in media for two decades at magazines at Condé Nast um, and Time Inc. at various different magazines on the marketing and business side. I came to GLAAD because when my wife and I had our twin 13 year old, now 13 year olds, I've been here nine years, um, I realized I needed to do more um, for making the world a better place. And I love media and I know how powerful media is. Um, and so this was the perfect place. I don't even consider this a job. This is a calling. I get to wake up every day and do what I love for a community that I love. Um, and so I've been doing it now for nine years. You know, wonderful. You know, as we said, there's been some stories in the headlines that are not so positive, and uh, I know that many of us have probably know by now that it was just a few weeks ago that there was a horrific shooting in, in Club Q in Colorado Springs where five people were killed and 17 wounded. You were there on the ground right away with a team from GLAAD. What did you learn from that? So we show up in, in those moments of crisis because we know that the media is going to flock there and we want to make sure that we have a say in what the narrative is. And so for us, what was really important was that this wasn't treated as an isolated incident. This was a culture of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric and violence that has been building. And we've been, the leaders in the community have literally, literally been screaming from the rooftops that this is coming because of what the culture looks like right now to be LGBTQ in. You know, when you look at this past year and you kind of lay it out from an LGBTQ standpoint, there were over 300 anti-LGBTQ bills proposed in uh, the legislative session. Most of them targeting kids, our youth. In addition to that, we just released a report out of GLAAD that there have been, and it's growing, there are over 125 violent attacks against drag events across this country this year. Fire bombs, open carry, people showing up with machine guns to drag events, like unbelievable. And then when you look at the rhetoric machine, so if you look at some of the media who has been targeting the LGBTQ community, Fox News has covered the drag events more than they've covered the January 6th hearings. Just to give you perspective, in three weeks, they did nine segments a day on drag events. That it's about groomers and corrupting children and all of these issues that don't exist, actually. Um, I mean, drag has been, arou been around since Shakespearean times. Um, so it's been, it, so what happened in Colorado was that we wanted to make sure that the press was framing this properly, that this was much bigger than one, it, one horrific incident, but this was building up to this and that our community is still very, very much in danger. And it, it is the rhetoric, you know, what role does the rhetoric about this community play in creating hostility and violence? And is there a role for all of us, LGBTQ, Latino, Latino allies, you know, to play in this? Absolutely. It's up to all of us. I mean, I think if I could say there's been a theme this morning, it's about us taking responsibility and, and, and action. And there's absolutely... Um, a responsibility. I would say even more so on allies, right? Because allies are in the room. They might not say it in front of me, but they will say it or they'll disparage our, our, our community. And what happens is, is we become dehumanized. And it's very easy to, to be violent against somebody or some group that you've dehumanized. And so I think that as we see the rhetoric pick up, I put it on all of us to, to speak up and to speak out and to say, well, you know, actually, I work with a gay person or I know a trans person. When you think about gay, lesbian, bi, about nine out of 10 Americans know someone who is. When you talk about the trans community, Three out of 10 Americans know someone who's trans. So where they're getting their information about trans is through media. And right now the media is doing a horrible job. Some, I, I mean, I could, I could divide it between news and journalism and, and, 
you know, um, and Hollywood. Hollywood, we're, we're really moving them along beautifully, actually, finally. Um, but in news and, and, and journalism, especially the rhetoric machine, that then feeds into social media that goes completely unchecked completely unchecked and if you're a parent in this room you know exactly what I'm talking about um, if you've got you know teenage kids who are on these devices um, it's just rampant there um, and so we need more support we need people in positions of power to speak up there's one more issue that I want to uh, talk about that's been also in the headlines and it's a case that is in front of the Supreme Court right now um, as we know there is a, a the Supreme Court has already listened to, has not made a decision yet, but has already listened to a case presented by a wedding website designer who claims religious views and freedom of speech to deny her services to same-sex couples. Talk to me about this case. This is a Colorado case. It's called 303 Creative. Uh, this is a great example of like, just pay attention for two seconds. If you look behind the curtain on this case, actually there is no same-sex couple that came to this web designer to create something for her, for them. So she created the issue before so, it happened. So, well, the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is an anti-LGBTQ and SBLC, which is a Southern Poverty Law Center, designated hate group created this case. And now it's sitting in front of the Supreme Court. Like, how does that happen in this country? So. What they're claiming, and they're, they're framing it around freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Um, and basically what they want to be able to do is deny a gay couple the ability to create a website. This was, uh, do you remember the gay cake case? Yes. Very similar. Same thing, same group, um, same bunch of lawyers, and they literally lost marriage equality and are always trying to find ways to target our community. Um, I, I think we're gonna lose it. I, I mean, if you read how it was presented on Tuesday, yeah, yeah. it was, it, they were leading. I mean, Alito, I mean, if you Talk read it. Of, uh, uh, what you think of some of the comments that were made by some of the conservative judges. I mean, the conversation turned kind of ridiculous after a while when they were talking about whether it was a Santa Claus and whether there was a kid dressed as KKK, if it was the Santa Claus could deny a hug to that kid. I mean, it just became ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, it was, it, I highly recommend a read if you have some spare time um, because it's, it's kind of amazing that this is taking place. Um, and it's all framed around freedom of speech, freedom of religion, when what it really is is the freedom to discriminate. And that's what they're looking for. So we have had, we have seen some good news, some good headlines, and some not so good headlines. So through GLAD's research, what do we know about how LGBTQ people feel right now? Uh, that's a great, uh, so, well, I'll say this, that 70% of LGBTQ people feel or ha have been, report being discriminated against in the past year. So that's a real world effects of all of this rhetoric. Uh, that's up 11% from the year before. It's up 22% from the year before that. So it's just growing, growing, growing as this, um, as this culture is becoming more and more hateful and full of rhetoric. I think also, one thing that I wanna point to that Stacy talked about too is representation. 90% of LGBTQ youth say that when they see someone that looks like them on TV, they feel better about themselves. It's powerful. Representation is so powerful because represent what happens on those screens actually affects what happens at the ballot boxes, at the school board level, in living rooms across America, at water coolers across America. That's where the power is and the influence is in representation. And so when we can represent LGBTQ people, Hispanic people, we change the world. It's so powerful. You know, talking about the importance of allies, through the research, what do we know about the connections and attitudes about LGBTQ people on the part of Latinos? 
Yeah. So I think for us at GLAD, our work has always been done in a dual way. So we have someone who oversees, who's here today, Monica, who oversees all of our um, Hispanic and um, Spanish speaking work. We do a media awards in Spanish speaking language. Um, and, and I think what we know is that this next generation is everything. And when you look at Gen Z, 40% of Gen Z identify as LGBTQ. According to the Gallup, I should say this, according to the Gallup poll, it's 20%. We do our own poll annually, and we have seen year over year over year, it's 40%. And who, who are a lot of those folks? Latinx, right? Um, so I think that when, when we think about the future, we're thinking about this next generation. And we feel really, really that it's so important that also the intersectionality of it all, right? You cannot, um, anyone who's marginalized needs to stick together. And I found it really, really helpful, especially with the Hispanic community. I work very closely with the ADL, um, which is the Anti-Defamation League um, for, for Jewish folks. Um, and I think that those kinds of collaborations are the wave of the future. I see a theme here from our previous panel where they talked about the importance of youth. And it seems like our youth is changing those views. If you compare it to their grandparents' views oh. on these types of issues, they are the ones that are leading the way. Um, Sarah Kate, I just want uh, to close with your call to action to protect LGBTQ rights and, and really lives. Yeah, well, I think. First and foremost, it's about voting, always. Um, we say at GLAD, voting is an identity, not an action. It has to be part of your identity. When's the next election? Where's the next election? Is it the school board? Um, those are really, really important elections right now, is at the local level. So voting is critical. <laughs> and finding what you're interested in and participating give time, give resources, give access. Um, we need to all come together right now because we are all being targeted. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of you, and, and thank you, Claudia, for including this important conversation.